Hello everyone, my name is Christian. Welcome back to TechMon. Today our guest is Barrett, the Senior Director of Revenue at Newbreed. Hello. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm pumped to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. At first, uh, I'll let you present yourself shortly to the audience. So for me, it's actually pretty straightforward. I am a, a tech guy, right? And right now I'm focused on leading the revenue team at New Breed, which I'll talk about certainly later on in more detail. My career has spread across everything from training and learning development to go-to-market strategy, but mainly in partnerships and B2B SaaS sales as a whole. Okay. Uh, tell us about New Breed. What, uh, what is it? Yeah, so New Breed is a revenue management firm. So what we do as a part of HubSpot's ecosystem, we're the number one partner in North America. And what we've done over the 15 years or so we've been in business is help companies grow more effectively. We drive better results using the HubSpot technology stack. Okay. We are at our core an agency. We actually evolved from that over time, doing things like marketing, demand gen, social media management, et cetera. Over the last five or so years, we've actually become more of a system integrator and technology partner. And so if you think about New Breed holistically, we help companies that are on or moving to the HubSpot tech stack, optimize their go-to-market, drive better demand, better sales enablement, better sales engagement, and ultimately tie together their system architecture, deliver better results as they grow their company. Okay. And you know this uh, infrastructure very well because you used to work at HubSpot, right? So I I'll let you know yeah. the story of you joining New Breed. When exactly did that happen? Yeah. Uh, and your study at HubSpot. <laughs> yeah, I'll give you the bigger picture. So I, I graduated college with an art degree. I have a digital design degree. Worked okay. in restaurants for a period of time because, frankly, the economy wasn't good when I graduated. And I liked the idea of a fast-paced environment. Managed restaurants, opened restaurants, had a really good career in that sense at that time. Went into tech, enjoyed it for some uh, two or so, some odd years. Got laid off at a time when the economy crashed again. And interesting <laughs> after, after collegiate years were interesting, certainly for me economically. Um, but then I got into tech again and the startup that I was at, we did really well. We exited and I had a friend over at HubSpot. And actually, interestingly enough, I refused to come here, but uh, push comes to shove. I, I found their opportunity to be really interesting. They were helping agencies help their customers grow better. And so I joined HubSpot back in 2015 as a partner acquisition rep, building a book of business, a book of partners that I could help grow. I did that for a couple of years. Um, was the head of sales training and first head of partner sales training for quite some time, building okay. out go-to-market and partner uh, onboarding and development programs. And then certainly HubSpot's own employees. Actually, interesting fact, trained about 1,200 people in a matter of about 18 months. So it was quite Whoa. the journey. Um, well, when I left that role, yeah, I left that because there's an interesting opportunity actually to come and manage New Breed, so the company I'm at now, as their partner manager. And so at a time when HubSpot was trying to support their best partners uh, differently, I had a new, unique opportunity to take my training and, and go-to-market background, bring it to this and a few other partners in a very specialized group of, of businesses, a specialized partner bucket, um, and work with them to grow better. And so I spent the next four years or so helping them to package price and sell HubSpot, scale their organization, help their customers grow. Think of me as one part consultant, one part go-to-market lead, one part sales rep. Okay. So really well, awesome trajectory yeah. in that sense. Yeah. Worked in direct for a period of time. And then as I left HubSpot, uh, my last year, I was in go-to-market strategy. And it was during that time that I started to recognize that while I enjoyed my almost eight and a half full years at the time there, Whoa. it was time for a change. And I wanted to take the learnings that I had developed in my you know, my time at HubSpot and go somewhere where I could take that skill set and help another company grow. After talking to a lot of the top partners, naturally, it made sense to go and work with the team that I cared about and knew intimately and really believed in their mission. And so for the last few months, I've been actually a new breed since. <laughs> That's a great story. And uh, what what are the biggest learnings that you got at HubSpot? Uh, you I guess that's a good question. Most folks uh, don't ask that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think specifically, I got what I would describe as a mini MBA. I was very fortunate during my time at HubSpot to learn everything around marketing, sales, service, platform, technology, and go-to-market strategy because I was there from about 400 employees to 8,500. And so wow. in eight years, yeah, that much growth is really interesting. There's a lot of pain, a lot of excitement, a lot of interesting <laughs> work that goes on. At its core, it was a mini MBA. But beyond that, I learned the value of customer-centric go-to-market, putting your customer at the focus of what you do. I learned about how partners can help certainly organizations go to market better, but that customers actually trust their partners more. And so there's a unique opportunity in tech to lean in there. And I've got a lot of passion and thoughts on it. I learned about how to sell better, to be consultative, to be supportive. But I think ultimately you know, I learned that technology can be more than just a tool to help companies make money. It can really change people's lives, both in the way that they grow their career and ultimately how they deliver value into whatever ecosystem they're a part of. So it was a really incredible part of my, my professional and personal life. 
<laughs> Absolutely. And eight years, that's amazing. Well, yeah, a uh, long time. Eight and a half years, a very long time. And why did you choose Newbreed? I think for me, it was pretty clear. Newbreed had a couple things that a majority of the other partners in the ecosystem do not right now. I knew first and foremost, to back up for a second, that I wanted to be in the ecosystem. I knew based off my time at HubSpot that I believed still very much in the mission that we could help millions of companies grow better. And what HubSpot has done very uniquely is build a platform that adapts to both input, so other systems and the way that they actually are, are worked with, but also output. So they optimize for you know, employees on the front line to do the best possible job. And I had been a frontline employee for at the time, a lot of my career. When I thought about you know, where in the ecosystem the impact was the highest, it was New Breed because of the way that they align their mission. So yes, they believe, like a lot of partners do, frankly, in helping customers, but they put the customer at the nucleus, the center of everything they do. And then they've developed, we, I should say now, we've developed this methodology around outcome-based servicing. So what okay. a lot of folks have done over the last 10, 15 years in agencies and system integrators in this ecosystem methodology is they've built a service that is tactical. So it's mm -hmm. outcomes but without that description. So it was really about output in that sense. So it was an outsourced marketing department. It was an outsourced sales enablement component. It was very tactical, it was very specific. What we do is we deliver, and this is what made me excited about New Breed in particular, we deliver outcomes based off of customer and company need. So we actually become go-to-market partners in that sense. We work directly with our customers to align to the things that are necessary for them to succeed. So it's not just a singular function. It is tech stack alignment. It is go-to-market strategy. It's content. It's enablement. It's all of these different components. And so at, at its core for me, if I distill it all down, it's about the holistic approach. And something for me um, that, you know, frankly, it, it's, it triggers this like really warm, fuzzy feeling, I guess, in many ways. And that's <laughs> that we're doing more than just helping somebody sell something. We're doing more than just helping somebody to acquire a new customer. We are helping them to grow their business in a more effective and a better way. And that's something I can get really passionate about. And then, of course, it's the people. It's an yeah. incredibly group of dedicated, committed, really, frankly, intelligent and charismatic individuals. That, to me, is nice because it's it's about doing good work, but it's about doing great work with great people that really makes it valuable. And that, to me, is exciting. And what do you actually do as the uh, senior director of, uh, director of revenue? And how many people are at the New Breed? New Breed? Yeah, I have such a that's such a ridiculous title. I, I mean, look, I, so my job is to lead the <laughs> offense, if you will. So I lead the sales org here, a little bit of the partnerships and, and help um, the business grow. I work with an incredible CRO who's helping to bring together our marketing and our service and certainly the sales teams. The advisors that work with me are, uh, there's nine of them right now. And, you know, they're, they span in terms of their career early stage, you know, just came up from BDR and getting started. So they're working with our SMB and mid-market segments, perhaps all the way up to folks that have been here for over 15 years working with our corporate and upmarket businesses. Well, Newbreed itself is roughly 100 employees right now. Um, I say roughly only because we're hiring pretty, you know, pretty quickly. So we'll, we're growing in that sense. But we've got this nice diversity in terms of both institutional knowledge, folks, again, that have really long tenure. And you know, I would describe it as like fresh minds, right? people that are coming to the business now with new ideas. And uh, let, let's talk mo more about SaaS because it's a SaaS podcast. I'd love to know if you have any advice for starting uh, people that are looking to get into partnerships, sales, or marketing in uh, SaaS, B2B SaaS. Uh, and then we can move from there with the, uh, your podcast. Uh, where can they find more uh, resources and stuff like that? Sure. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I think I get this question differently. Um depending on the day of the week and the, what's in the media and whatnot. But I think starting your career and looking at marketing, sales, service, partnerships is smart because these are all typically customer-facing roles. I actually believe that everybody should sell at some point in their career, regardless of what your long-term opportunity is or what you want to do. You want to be a CEO, you want to be a head of product, you want to go and open up a dry cleaner, like irrespective of what your intent and goal is, there's a benefit to selling because it does three specific things for you. It teaches okay. you how to work with people. It teaches you how to take a bump on the elbow or you know a, a skin knee kind of thing. I mean, it, it teaches you a little bit of integrity and a little bit of um, gut, if you will, in that sense. And the third that I think is probably the most valuable is it makes you adaptable. You have to be flexible and you have to be accommodating and you have to be not just a communicator, as I described, and a communicator with thick skin, but somebody who's willing to flex based off of who they're interacting with. If you are brand new out of college, you want to get into business, I would say very specifically, go be an SDR, a sales rep. Um, a BDR, an early stage rep, right in that sense, somewhere, and just go and learn the mechanisms of how to pick up a phone, how to call somebody, learn how to do the pitch, right? How to do the objection handling, the fundamentals. If you are perhaps a little bit further in your career, 
I'd say look for opportunities to do all of those things over a period of time. So I'm a firm believer in, I use this analogy quite often, so forgive me if you're listening and you've heard it before, but um, I think about it like this. This may be a little bit American, forgive me, but when when you buy a Lego kit, you know, the Lego bricks mm-hmm. that everyone sort of knows from their childhood, yes. when you buy Legos, you get this little green mat, right? This like big green mat, if you will, in that sense. And on that mat is where you build your house or your spaceship or whatever you bought, right? Yes. I think about that mat as the time when you leave primary education. Okay. And so maybe you've got like a few bricks on there. You've got a couple blues or oranges or greens. And maybe you had a decision early on in your life that said, I want to be this career trajectory. I want to be a doctor, a lawyer, a nurse to be traditional, right? So you've got a bunch of a specific color of brick and size, right? But the rest of us, I think a majority of us these days are generalists. We are diverse in our experience. My perspective is that if you are under 40 years old, You should try and put as many bricks on that platform as you can, because those bricks allow you to not build one tower that keeps you into a specific vertical in terms of growth, but it allows you to diversify and draw from experience. So I myself have a pyramid. I think about it, a flat top (laughs) pyramid, almost like a Mayan pyramid in that I've been in restaurants, I've been in startups, I've been in tech, I've been in a variety of different industries that have enabled me agencies now, right? I've been in a high growth SaaS company. I've been in a small startup. I've been all these different diverse backgrounds. That's incredible. Yeah. like, And I think something interesting about being able to put these bricks on my platform to elevate me, certainly, because I have experience and I have background, I have context, but I can draw from those different moments to enable me to be really dynamic when I talk to a customer, when I talk to a prospect, when I work you know, with my team to build our go-to-market strategy, et cetera. So if I think about advice in terms of getting into it, look for a company and everyone says, well, I want a company where I can grow, but how you grow is very important. And so if your decision is, I want to be this specific thing, great. Set a goal. Give yourself a one, three, and five year horizon. Plan accordingly and know that your five year horizon is going to change every time, but you know, and focus on it. If you're more like me, then you should be saying to yourself, How do I do something for 24 months? How do I go be a sales rep for two years? Then how do I go and move from sales to CS for two years? And then how do I move from CS to partnerships for two years? And so now you're six or eight years into your business, you know, experience and you've got a little marketing, a little sales, a little CS, a little partnerships. You become a really interesting candidate and you can start to write your own story at that point as you want to move forward in your career that's amazing and i also want to add something when i joined uh, my first startup tech one uh, at 19 uh, the ceo asked me what do you like to do and i at that time i thought it was just social media and i said uh, social media and he told me you're too young to know what you want to do so i'll make you do marketing sales the data entry uh, customer success uh, partnerships, uh, raising uh, investment, and all this stuff, and then you'll want, to, then you'll decide what you want to do. And see exactly, yeah, walk through through all of them. So I think yeah. it's a great mindset. It is, yeah, it's great advice too. I'm glad you that you said that to you. I, I think it's, I'm gonna, it's a bit of a soapbox. Forgive me, but I think generally speaking, the media, society, the people that are around us as we grow up are telling us we have to know what we want to do. I, I'm 39 going on 40, like, I don't know what I want to do the rest of my life. I know what I want to do right now. It's interesting. Right. And I think as long as you are intentional around being able to draw connections between those experiences, you like, look at my HubSpot career. I had five different jobs. I was an acquisition rep. I was a head of training. I was managing top partners. I was in corporate leadership. I was in go-to-market strategy. That's an interesting trajectory, but each of those built on Lego bricks that allowed me to tell my story in terms of how I wanted to be at least I'll tell you transparently, at some point leading a company. I'm going to either you know, lead as a CRO, I'm going to go and be CEO. I've got des- you know, um, destinations that I want to get to, things that I, I aspire course. to do. The more diverse my experience, the more helpful I can be when I get to those next inflection points. So I agree with you. That's great. <laughs> I love your mindset. Uh, what did you say were the most uh, or, or the biggest challenges that you faced throughout the career? Big picture, I think it is the expectation that I have to have the answers. So I think if you look at my earlier career, I believe, I'm going to swear, forgive me, but people had their shit together. No one does. No one knows what they're doing. It only All we do is, too. <laughs> yeah, like we, we have perspective, right? We yeah. have more time in seats. So if I think about myself you know, now versus me 10 years ago, I know a lot more because I've done a lot more and I still have so much to learn. It's not singular. I don't look at it in one dimension. I look at it in terms of the big picture. So for me, I think for folks that are listening, one of the things to think about is those hurdles of sort of self-doubt and self-deprecation. Oh, I don't know enough. Oh, I can't do enough. I try really hard to push those aside. I've been reading um, The Daily Stoic. It's yep, Ryan Holiday. He wrote this. It. Yeah, it's a great book. Great, it's great. Yeah. I'm actually in my second year, so I read it last year. I'm still reading it now with some friends now. Um, 
But one of the core concepts is this idea that the only thing we can control are our emotions. The only thing, not our body, our mind, our soul, anything else, just our emotions, right? And if you believe that that's actually true and perhaps you lean into it, which I have recently, then I would say one of my biggest challenges was the opposite of that, which is that the expectation that my own investments, my own time spent were not perhaps as, um, I think in some ways like valuable, right? Perhaps, or that I was limited by the things that I had done. Those those self-fulfilling prophecies, you circle back on that and go, well, I can't because I told myself I can't. So the opposite being true, I say now I, I look at things and say, well, I can do anything I want. Like yes. We always were told when we were kids, perhaps, hopefully. <laughs> um, what I realize is that time and seed is the most valuable. So the biggest hurdles for me were, were the things I described just now. And then also, and I, I would say transparently, not having as much of my own self-direction figured out. I don't, it took me until only a couple of years ago. I don't need to know what I want to be when I grow up. I will never know that. I don't need to know what I want to do in 10 years, but I should have a plan that says, here's what I want to do for the next 12 months. A smart guy once said to me, a peer of mine said, you can do anything for a year. Great. Like that's a good, important fact. <laughs> yes. Realizing that was an important hurdle. Do anything for a year, have a, an expectation, a goal, a, a horizon of three years. What am I building towards? What, I, what am I doing here? Yeah. And then have a five-year aspiration. Um, and I think there's this really interesting quote. I'm, I'm soapbox. I told you I'll get off it here. But Matthew McConaughey, I'm not going to do him justice, but he said something at a graduation speech around the fact that he was asked what his um, his hero, who his hero was. He said, okay. it's me in, in 10, 10 years. years. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I love that speech. <laughs> if you don't know what that is, you're listening to this, go Google it. It's on YouTube. You'll see it. But he basically says, like, I am my own hero because I aspire to be the best version of myself. And I will never achieve that. And I accept that as the reality, that the aspiration of excellence, of fulfillment is what keeps me moving. That was a hurdle for me. It took me a long time to realize that the picking my head up and looking further down the road would allow me to be better, more fulfilled, more productive overall. That's amazing. I absolutely love it. I have the book right here, The Daily Story. It's oh, in, I love it. It's in I Romanian, it. but still, I, I love it. That's uh, great. I think we we talked so much about general stuff and let's say more on the mindset and this is really helpful. I love it. But let's dive a bit uh, at the end of the podcast now uh, into strategic advice or tactical advice for sure. partnerships. Let's say, how how do you start building a partnership channel? Yeah, I, there's a lot of folks right now that are talking about partnerships because it's trendy and cool and you know it's the buzzword of the week, if you will. I think yeah. what's most important that I've found is that identifying places where by working with other organizations, you can add more value to your customer. That is the first intersection you have to look out for. Okay. There's a world in which I think most people say, how do I build partnerships? What you should be asking is, how do I build value? And from that value, you can identify second and third party organizations that your customers likely already working with. That's where your early partnership program, partnership value, partnerships in general should actually come from. I think about it in three pillars. So you've got your standard sort of marketing, go to market, demand, gen, and awareness. You've got your sales, go to market, which now, interestingly enough, is actually a little bit less of the you know one to many and a lot more personal. It's a lot more targeted account, targeted individual based prospecting and outreach to deliver value early. So you go and you you provide an article, you provide a comment on LinkedIn, you want to deliver value. Partnership is no different. The third pillar of go-to-market for everybody this year should be thinking about who the other businesses are that your customers are working with, whether they are using your software or your service to deliver additional value, or they are simply another integration or some other ancillary service that works tangentially with your platform or service itself. Either of those circumstances, there are companies that are also with your customers and they likely have your customers trust way before you do. Those are your go-to-market partnerships. Look for those folks through observation. Frankly, ask your customers. Go to them and say, who else are you working with? Where else are you getting value? Because that's going to provide you with the avenue for which you can go and have a more impactful conversation around, specifically with that customer, or excuse me, with that um, the potential partner. How do we yeah. work with our, our businesses yeah. to help that customer? So at the core, if the customer is the value that you're looking for, partnerships come from the intersection of value between you and another organization, elevating the output that that customer gets. I always say start there. And it comes through conversations with your customers and observations of who else is working with them. That's great. I, I want to make a note with it after after the podcast and probably make it a short. Uh, I'm also curious about what do you think is working in 2024 regarding uh, go-to-market strategies? We see a lot of social selling, personal branding. I know you're also quite active there. So yeah. I'd love to know your opinion. I think personal is an important thing to call out. I actually... I might. I haven't said this out loud. I'm going to say it. I've been thinking it. I would. I would expect that the next two to three years, you're going to see social media 
uh, activation, if you will, activity be much higher by individuals because what they realize is that their own personal brand is what matters. Customers buy from people they like. Partners work with people they like, right? Businesses around people helping people, hopefully, ideally. Yes. And so yes. I think you, that's the shift, right? Yeah. And everyone loves to say AI, right? So I'm going to say this out loud. I always joke if I this comes up, but like AI, if you're listening to me, I'm your friend, right? We're all buddies here in that sense. <laughs> But if, you know, if we can't ignore the elephant in the room, which is that this technology is allowing us to do more with less, right? We can be yeah. more productive with less time. If we work under that assumption, then I do think you're going to see this amplification of individual brand opinion and perspective over time. I'll say, I actually haven't said this out loud either. I'll say it openly on this recording for you. I've been exploring how I can use OpenAI and how I can use ChatGPT to collectively take the thoughts that I've shared guest spots like this, my own show, which we can talk about, places where I've shared my thoughts, my opinion, my perspective, my learnings. How can I suck that up into a one centralized learning space where I could share that with my audience? That's an interesting way to amplify well, myself. Yeah. yeah. Like a I think I've almost got it figured out. Playbook. Yeah. Well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a little bit of a playbook, a little bit of a guide, a little bit of this kind of like go-to-market framework. But the idea being that I think you're going to see, I expect you will see individuals trying to deliver more value at scale the ones that will get it right are the ones that do it for the right reasons. I like to talk about partnerships because I spend a bunch of time in it. I love yep. go to market because I do this every day. It's fun for me. My wife laughs. She's like, you know, really like love this stuff. I love it. Absolutely love it. It gets me excited. So why not share that with the world more effectively? That I think is the shift. The other side of that, the kind of dark side, if you will, is that people are going to do it just for the sake of doing it. And so I think the trend will be, yep. how do you identify truly valuable content as it sits in the market? The other shift that I think you're going to see is the, um, in some ways, I think perhaps the the reduction of the aperture for which people are trying to amplify their message. So right now, it's just like one to everyone, right? How can I just get as many folks to pay attention as possible? Yes. What I've learned through my own experience is do the opposite, get hyper niche, hyper specific, and start small. And then from that little microcosm of trust and value you deliver, expand a little bit. As you learn some more, expand a little bit and do that over and over again. And yeah, your your influence, your reach, your impact will significantly grow over time, but that it takes time to actually get there is the key thing. And so I think the third piece of this is going to be people investing in longer term strategy, right? So it's not just what do we get in terms of value today, but it's how do I build audience? How do I build community? A very buzzy, but important word. People like Mark Killens, former HubSpot, super smart guy, doing mm -hmm. some really good things over at his company. There are people that are thinking differently about community. The shift being that you're going to see traditional go-to-market marketing, table stakes still take place, sales still take place, but that partnerships and community would be the next leverage point because that's going to build better trust in the market. That's the third trend I think you'll identify. I appreciate so much. We have four minutes left. I have two quick questions. Sure. First, I'd love to know more about your podcast. And yep. last, last question, if you have a favorite SaaS product that you use and you'd share with, uh, with others. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. So for me, my show is called Outcomes. It's about conversations with people that have been there, done the work and have a story to tell about it. Frankly, I have been a little bit lax the last three weeks in terms of putting out content. I'm sorry if you're a listener and you're checking this out. Um, I transitioned <laughs> jobs and obviously had to focus on getting settled yeah. in. However, what I do is typically post every week a roughly 20 minute episode where I interview somebody across B2B partnerships and tech. Amazing. And the intent is that you're learning a little bit of something tactical, a little bit of something actionable from that interview. The intent is that you can listen to this on the way to the grocery store or soccer practice between meetings, get something that's valuable and you can go and do something with it. For me, technology right now is at the core of everything that I do. I love HubSpot. I'm biased. I was there for a very long time. It's actually interesting. Um, since you asked the question, right now we're on Riverside. I think it's one of the coolest, most valuable platforms in it terms is. of podcasting. Yes. I get questions a lot about my setup. So three things I tell people. So this will be very podcast specific. I could talk about, to be clear, like call recording software, AI tools, like that stuff's really great. It's a trend. It's interesting. I think open AI is interesting. There's some cool stuff going on, but because, you know, as a fellow podcaster, you get this, the Shure MV7, which is the microphone I'm using, great tool, really affordable, super good fidelity, great audio. But the thing that I like most, besides the fact that Riverside's the platform we're using, is that we can be in different countries right now, different time zones, and it looks and feels like we're having a live conversation because we effectively are. The platform does that, Riverside recording yes. async and being valuable. But also, my, my shameless plug here is I'm using a Sony ZV-E10 right now with a prime lens. I love this camera. I know it's not specifically technology in terms of software, but I just love really good tech that does its job very well. And of all the tools that I have, this camera has been a great investment. I see it. I, I like it. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, is there anything else that you want to mention on the podcast? 
No, I mean, look, I, I love our conversation. I appreciate you having me on. It's been a great chat. If folks want to reach out and have a dialogue with me, I'm sure you'll tag me on LinkedIn, but I'm glad to be connected with on LinkedIn. It's Barrett J. King. You can find me. There's only a few Barretts and I'm the only one in in, uh, in the Boston area. Um, <laughs> I love this stuff. I love B2B. I love tech. I love go to market. I'm really passionate about partnerships, certainly marketing sales and partnerships together. So I'm just glad to be a resource. And the last thing I'll say is I didn't have a lot of mentors coming up in the industry. But if there are people that want to have a conversation for some advice or feedback, I'll spend 10 minutes with anybody. So glad to have you reach out. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you for your energy and your advice. I, I appreciate it. You're a great person. Thank you so much. <laughs> My pleasure.